Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today again. Uh, we have an invited speaker from McMaster University. Dr. Xin Fang is a professor of engineering physics and biomedical engineering at McMaster University. He's also a Canada Research Chair in Biophotonics. He moved to McMaster in 2005, uh, joining there from uh, uh, Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. As it happens, I met Xin there. So we overlapped there for about three years yep. or so. Uh, his um, uh, bachelor's uh, of sciences in physics from Nankai University in China and a master's from East Carolina University in biomedical physics and PhD uh, as well from East Carolina University. Um, his research interests include the optical spectroscopy, image guided uh, minimally invasive diagnostic and therapeutic devices, miniaturized sensors and imaging systems, advanced optical microscopy for emerging applications. Let's thank the, uh, the invited speaker for coming here. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Very nice to see you after almost a decade. <laughs> and uh, very, thank you very much for the afternoon seminar. And uh, today I was uh, going to tell you a little bit more about one of our projects in doing uh, high-speed microscopy, essentially. And uh, specifically, it's uh, high-speed confocal microscopy. And uh, so we start working on, this is one of the first projects I started working on that once I got to my master that, uh, over a decade ago. And at the time, my collaborator, Dr. Andrews, who is a biochemist, some of you guys may have known him, that he's looking at uh, uh, problems in drug development for cancer. And uh, you probably already know, I don't have to say too much, the cost of the cancer drug development or any drug de development is actually quite costly. And one of the issues for the costing and also the long time that required to develop a drug is that uh, in clinical trials. But if you look at the pipeline to develop drugs, that uh, the holdup is not actually really at the clinical trials, but earlier. In terms of uh, target identification and also target validation. So essentially, chemists starting with making probably millions or of hundreds of thousands of different uh, drug leads from different types of chemical compounds. And then the next step after the so-called high throughput screening, that uh, they narrow down some of the hundreds of thousands of drug leads into a couple of thousands, and in a process called high content screening. And in this process, ideally, you want to narrow down to a handful of those uh, uh, real uh, leads that, uh, to go through uh, animal test, preclinical animal testing, and also clinical testing. And if you do a good job in narrow those hundreds of thousands uh, leads down to a few, a handful of uh, really effective leads, and with actually the dosimetry that uh, required to administrate those leads, then the clinical trial will be very smooth, and the successful rate of the trial uh, will be high. But if uh, that you don't, and uh, have a very specific target, and then enter into the clinical trials, and that become an issue. So we are targeting actually the middle part. I was told to actually use this. So this is the part that we're targeting in using microscopy. Essentially that we're take harvest uh, normal and uh, cancer cells, that uh, we're testing those probably thousands of, uh, or tens of thousands of leads were already narrowed down from the basic chemistry, and uh, try to see actually how those uh, uh, potential leads, chemical compounds react uh, uh, with uh, the, the, the cells react with those compounds to see whether certain pathways, uh, initially that we look at whether the cells will die or normal cells will leave and then cancer cells will die, but eventually we realize that it's the, actually the drug develop the signaling pathways for protein-protein interactions that are important. So we are using microscopy to characterize those pathways. And uh, that present a typical process like this is that you have uh, probably seen those uh, uh, cassettes or well plates that we put uh, cells, incubate cells in those high-density well plates and then apply different drugs to it and to see how they respond. Or we apply the same drug at a different 
doses to those uh, uh, to those cells and to see which dose actually be more effective. And even more that we can actually test in dosing strat strategies. When you go see a doctor that has been prescribed a more complicated medicine, sometimes you will get to uh, customize the routine such as um, two pills in the morning, three pills in the afternoon, so they may actually change. How do they actually know that? One of the initial steps are actually testing those dosages on cells. And so when you do this, you're generating hundreds of thousands of sometimes millions of combinations that you, actually, uh, you have to test on real cells. And that posed a requirement of uh, how can you do this and manually look at those cells uh, through imaging Obviously, it's not a solution. So uh, we built, and or the industry built, that uh, so-called high-content screening systems, that uh, which are the systems that uh, they automatically and then ultimately use such an assembly line that doing those uh, imaging those cells uh, that from an incubator take them out and put them back, and uh, doing hundreds of thousands of images per day. And, and monitor their progress over the course of a couple of days or up to a couple of weeks. And in this process, it posed a very high requirement for imaging speed. And because for each of the well that you typically have to uh, image a multiple area of interest, and uh, if you want to do more complicated microscopy, that posed a bit of issue. That, that's what we actually try to target. And then from the biology side, I mentioned that we are not only simply look at whether those cells will live or die at the end of a week. We're also looking at the signal pathways of what actually how those drugs that interact with the cell and then tell the drug, tell the cell, cancer cells to, to go through the suicide cycle, such as apoptosis, or that to leave the normal cells alone. And uh, this type of signal pathways and uh, typically happen that when you have a drug at the cell membrane that they pass, uh, generate some signal pass to a certain type of protein. That protein will actually pass the signal along through different type of proteins in the cell and through a designated uh, pathway that eventually tell the mitochondria to stop working. That uh, this is one of the pathways that uh, you tell the cell to go through a suicide cycle, such as uh, called the apoptosis. So it's a organized the program the way for the cells to die, therefore that when they decompose, they can be actually, their waste can be managed. That, uh, so many cancer cells uh, work in this way, and then the key part is to see why, uh, what drug and which drug and how they actually can be used effectively is characterizing that uh, whether that drug and uh, post a designed or uh, expected effect on that uh, the signal pathway, essentially that uh, how they interact with certain proteins. So we want to characterize protein. And uh, so let's actually take the example of uh, two proteins. One is called BCLSL, and the other one called BAD. And those are clever chem biochemistry names that they come up with. And what we actually do is that we tag the two type of cell proteins, one is the B cell XL, and with a blue protein called M cerulean 3. And the other one that uh, we tagged with another fluorescent protein called the Venus. And by tagging these two, and then we can see whether these two proteins have different colors that will actually light up differently and as they interact and uh, with each other. So when they are not interacting with, uh, with each other, if we only illuminate uh, or shining light uh, that uh, more effectively by absorbed by the donor, we only see donor and not the acceptor. And so we don't see the other bad yellow protein. But if they are interacting with each other, that, which means that they actually follow some orientation, they actually uh, uh, coupling to each other and then release. In this process, that uh, the distance between the donor and the acceptor are close enough. Therefore, that uh, if, when you excite the donor, that the energy that not actually being released at the fluorescence of the donor, but rather than uh, excite resonantly transferred to the acceptor, that you actually will see acceptor uh, uh, fluorescence. In that case, that you will see acceptor fluorescence rise at the location and there were instances that uh, uh, there is a protein-protein interaction through this fluorescence resonance energy transfer process called FRET. And FRET, uh, if you want to use uh, quantum mechanics, you can actually look at uh, uh, this way. 
And uh, so basically that uh, this is the donor protein that you excite the donor. Instead of uh, emit green light from the donor, that uh, the energy being randomly transferred and uh, to the acceptor that uh, it will, which will emit uh, red fluorescence. So essentially that if you can see red fluorescence and or reduction of the green fluorescence, that uh, that's where the location and the instances that uh, the interaction will happen. And uh, one way to do that is looking at not only their color, because it's very hard to see color that, uh, uh, in the cells, and, uh, but you look at their lifetime. Essentially, that how much time that uh, a fluorescence protein stays in an uh, excited state. So, you know, which means that we're looking both the spectral differentiation and also how much time that which is a characteristic of that certain protein. And uh, in that case, that we can be more certain you know, for certain uh, protein interact, and but most importantly, we can quantitatively that to measure their interaction and uh, rather than qualitatively. So to do that, we need to measure fluorescence lifetime. And the fluorescence lifetime is something that uh, typically within the range of a few nanoseconds. That's a very short time that, uh, to measure and especially that uh, doing imaging. So typically electronics, our high speed electronics are now dealing with the gigabytes of data that uh, in fiber optics trans, uh, communication and for data analysis. To measure a, a few nanoseconds of lifetime, you need uh, tens of gigabytes of electronics that, uh, uh, tens of gigabytes, uh, gigahertz of electronics in order to actually measure those. That's actually pushing the limit of the uh, digitization of the electronics and uh, that become uh, uh, a little bit tricky. And, uh, but nonetheless, that fluorescent life imaging that has been applied that uh, in the last uh, decade or so, that has become an emerging technique. And actually one of the projects uh, we worked with uh, together with Spectrum in Cedar sinai is that uh, using uh, hyperspectral imaging with uh, fluorescent lifetime imaging for calcium imaging. And uh, so this is actually one of the typical, this is probably a little bit too bright, but this is a typical uh, slice. I think uh, a little bit dimmer. I think that's okay. That, okay, I can demonstrate that. Uh, so essentially, that uh, this is the blue fluorescence. That's the green fluorescence, and uh, you will see that when fret happens, uh, will be without fret, that you don't see the green channel. And then in this case, that uh, we have both green and uh, uh, blue show up. That's where all the green are excited randomly that uh, through the fret uh, uh, interaction, and then you also see the lifetime change that uh, which show up in this uh, figure. And so there, in the areas that where you have a green fluorescence, you also have lifetime changes in those locations. And the degree of the lifetime change shows you actually how close and how strong the interaction is. And that tells you how that reliable that uh, interaction, the protein-protein interaction is in the signal pathway. So you can specifically target this too. And here is another plot that how do you actually look at and uh, uh, this is a non-interaction one, and this is a, when you start to have fret, if you only look at the spectral imaging, you will have actually uh, a very large spread, but over here, uh, you can look at the lifetime changes, and, some, and you can specifically see which one and how much interaction you have for each one of the individual protein pairs. So that's been, and then from there, you can calculate their fret efficiency, and then, um, and the, uh, later on, it will be so-called a uh, KD factor, which is a standard way to characterize uh, that effectiveness of a uh, drug. And now we know that uh, this is all biology background. That's why we actually want to do it. But the next part is actually the focus of the talk is why, how do you actually do it? Fast frame imaging is what we are trying to do, essentially fluorescence lifetime imaging. Essentially that we are trying to measure something at a billion frames per second. And uh, here's the example of uh, high-speed imaging. And uh, there are a number of factors limit that how fast you can do imaging. And in the bottom over here, that is a frame of a case that uh, who actually bend down throughout the ball like a burpee that uh, this is actually one of the hardest event that you capture in high-speed imaging. And especially in the microscopy content is 
this is a non-repeatable non event. So every time the kid's doing that, it will be different. So essentially, you need to actually image the whole theory with a very high frame and in one single shot. And, uh, but luckily, that uh, most of the events that we're talking about, that they're repeatable. And so we actually can, even with a slower frame rate, if you actually time them correctly, so every time this case, if this is a, uh, a repeatable event, that if you time the start very accurately, you can take one frame, and then next time the kids jump, that you take the next frame, and then with a little bit of delay. And in that case, you can recreate the event. That's essentially majority of, of our uh, fluorescent lifetime imaging does. And so we're not, at this point, we're not actually really doing high-speed imaging, but rather very precise gating and time control. So I want to get that first. And uh, nonetheless, that uh, it requires your detectors to be gated at the nanosecond or sub-nanosecond, typically 200 picoseconds regime, that uh, if you want to do uh, ICCD-based uh, detection schemes and then high-speed electronics. And in this case, it's very expensive propagation. And uh, typically, those type of systems cost uh, probably hundreds of thousand dollars if you want to buy from light source to detector, and uh, w even without a microscope. But the basic principle that is uh, relatively simple, that you have a blue uh, fluorescence, uh, you have a blue, uh, blue fluorescence uh, uh, excitation, and sorry, blue excitation, and then the red is the fluorescence. In order to actually capture the event, you can capture the three points. If it's a bi exponential, that is three points will be enough. And if you capture this event either in one shot or actually in repetitive shots, if you can control the timing correctly, you can rebuild the decay curve and then calculate the time. And uh, so, in order to do that for imaging, there are different ways to do that. And then the first way is that. Uh, you can do it through a confocal imaging, that, uh, which that you t acquire one pixel at a time. And uh, then you use a, a high-speed digitizer, such as uh, hazard time quality single photon counting. You can digitize this one single point at a time, and then for a curve, and then calculate a lifetime. Or that uh, you can use uh, something called a spectrograph. You can acquire that the whole uh, line of the images all together, or that you can do a whole image together and uh, so in the last two part, this part that require a device called a street camera, and the next one requires something called of intensified CCD. Essentially, this one, the intensified CCD is a fast uh, uh, gating device that uh, will take uh, a 200 to 500 picosecond snapshot that at the time, and then moving the frame forward. You scan in time instead of uh, uh, in space. Well, well, that the conf typical fun confocal flame setup that they scan in spatially and they acquire everything in one shot uh, that uh, in time. So to s speed up this process, you actually can use uh, something called the spinning disk confocal. So in this case, that you don't do one point at a time because that would be very slow. And uh, you can do many points at a time that uh, you, through this spiral pattern, uh, uh, confocal disk called the NIPCO disk. And when you rotate that, those, uh, because of spiral pattern, the tr track of the rotating circle of each one of those focal arrays does not overlap. And therefore, as you rotate, you build up the whole image to fill that all image. And your detector can be actually open all the time. And uh, so then you can actually acquire a 2D, very high speed uh, uh, confocal image and uh, in a relatively short period of time. And uh, if you use a gating method at the CCD part over here, and uh, then you will be able to uh, gate in time. Every time you acquire one image at one gating, one delay setting, and then you can move on to the next one. So that's uh, a technique we developed uh, that uh, uh, through some uh, collaboration with uh, Perkin Almer and for a high content screening system. This technique has been implemented about two decades ago, and uh, we, our initial effort to do this is how we actually can make this one into an automated microscopy system. So we build a system that, uh, to do that, and then we find out that there are certain 
issues. And so this is actually the opera system that uh, we build with Perkin Armor. And uh, we typically can get maximum 10 flame per second, but in reality, in all, in reality, that when we have a real live cell samples, that becomes actually about 30 seconds per frame. And for very dim sample, because you need enough time to accumulate. And so then we decided, OK, if we cannot do full frame at the time, we'll go to a different detector, the detector called a street camera. So the street camera itself is the, works as, as the photon actually entering the device. And you apply for a vertical. Uh, with, they will convert into photoelectrons. The photoelectron will hit a phosphor screen in the back. As the electrons move across the street camera, you apply for a vertical voltage. So then they will actually, just like you swim across a river, as the speed of the flow changes, that you actually will end up at different locations across the river. So we do that to electrons. And in, by the time, because that the, the time we're trying to measure is essentially the arrival time of the photons at the photomultiplier, to the MCP, the multi-channel plate over here. So if you, have, you know the constant flow time as, you actually screw, as a group of people swim across the river, the landing location on the other bank becomes actually a measure of time they arrive on the other side, assuming that they all swim at the same constant speed, which actually holds true for all those photoelectrons, because their speed actually flying this direction is actually a constant value. So by using this, you can actually measure very high speed event. The three, uh, typically, street cameras are designed for many events up to typically a picosecond or so. So that's a two order of magnitude of higher time position. And uh, the advantage of that, uh, you are not only have one, right now, we only show one stream of one location on the slit, but you can actually measure the whole slit. And uh, therefore, you actually go back to this setup that you actually can measure one the slit of the three camera input, you can measure a line at a time instead of one point at a time. So we decided, OK, if we can look at this to see whether that we can do using the street camera to do this. And uh, in order to do that, and uh, our problem is how do you convert a squared 2D image that into a line? And uh, in order to actually do this, so we instead of actually we just to give a line because street camera has a very terrible spatial resolution that uh, uh, when you actually enter uh, enter the uh, slit, so we decided that using a micro lens array to generate a 2D focal array and on the sample, and then transfer this through by rearrange the fiber bundle. So we couple each one of the focal plane into a fiber bundle, which is 2D using micro lens array, and then rearrange this fiber bundle array into a straight line, and then enter this line into the street camera. And so although we're still imaging a 2D focal array match, and they being rearranged into a straight line, and then we can use a street camera to measure that. And we, along the process, we applied a couple of tricks, including that uh, since we're using fiber, we give the fiber, alternative fiber different lenses. Therefore, that they actually arrive at, consistently arrive at different groups on the street camera at different time, because we can adjust the lens of fiber that translates to how much time that actually they, how much time delay they, uh, uh, they experience that when inside of the fiber. And that will actually generate a line over here that uh, as actually that each one of the bar over here, this is actually a decay curve. And uh, that's another decay curve for another fiber. So you can have a straight line over here, line input. And then from the street camera readout, you can read out the, the position differences. And then you can measure the time decay in one sh single shot. You don't have to actually. Uh, make a multiple shots of that uh, for the same points. And that become actually quite efficient. And uh, we also can play tricks. And uh, since we have fibers of a different length, 
and we can adjust these length differences and then make uh, the uh, streak uh, alternatively that go in different directions, therefore uh, to uh, minimize the crosstalk between each one, each channel, which is uh, a way to improve how many fiber channels we can pack into that uh, street camera input line. So we can input, uh, multiply, and then uh, increase the multiplex, uh, multiplexing capability. And uh, from here, and uh, that become another problem. Since we are actually using a lens array to couple to a fiber and uh, from a 2D array, obviously that uh, this rotating NIPCAL disk method won't work. So on the sample end, we still have to scan that uh, because we only have uh, discrete uh, focal arrays, in order to form an image, you need to have a continuous uh, data acquisition between each one of those data points. How do we do that? And uh, instead of uh, using the NIPCAL disk, which we can't, because that we have uh, fixed distances that are between each of the fiber, we insert a piece of glass and then tilt the glass. As you're tilting the glass, a uh, collimated beam will be refracted at the interface, and then it will refract it back. So it will go along the same direction of travel, but with a vertical shift. So if you actually just, uh, wig -wag uh, just uh, wiggling that uh, this uh, plate, you actually can shift the, la shift the laser pointer at the back and forth and then left and right if you put another one in this, another direction and uh, without uh, that uh, uh, changing the travel direction. So if you can do this for one beam, you can also do that for a number of beams in a 2D square array. And so we did a calculation and then tried that approach and then found out actually this is a quite effective way to scan a 2D array that uh, our target. And from there, we built our system. This is actually the uh, one of the uh, glass windows, and then it's windows, and uh, you just uh, scan, scan a piece of glass. And uh, as long as you have uh, high precision in control the weight of the uh, glass, then you can do that very precisely. And uh, that actually gives you a very high acquisition speed and a good spatial resolution. And uh, then the temporal resolution, because it's controlled by street camera, is also very good. And so you can collect entire fluorescence array that in one repetition for each one of the points. And we're still actually collecting that uh, we have to do spatial scan, but that's a much smaller scan area compared to that you have to scan uh, across the whole field of view. We actually only scan a very small field uh, area that from one adjacent uh, focal point to the other. So that's a much smaller scanning area. So, and the, in the end, we can validate this approach. The lifetime measure is actually achieved by for the street camera, and it's a pretty good agreement and with high uh, precision that, uh, to achieve those lifetimes. And here are then we apply to uh, the live cells. And you can see that uh, this is a wide field imaging microscope that is using frequency domain lifetime. And uh, this is uh, uh, the one that is using confocal. And uh, here is the, our streak image of the similar type of cells. And the, our system that was uh, slightly less uh, powerful objective that we can still actually do that with very high uh, spatial resolution. And from the lifetime part that we also that we can achieve uh, fairly good lifetime measurements that with uh, uh, relatively reasonable acquisition time. And uh, so here is an, another example that uh, both uh, uh, convocal image and uh, then the lifetime image and also that uh, the lifetime data analysis. If you notice in our image, so here is actually a black spot. And there are actually another black spot somewhere over here. And then you can actually see there are square patterns. So those are artifacts of our scanning. Because each of those black, this is actually a dead fiber in our fiber array. And we have 100 to 10 by 10 fiber and form 100 fiber arrays. So this is one of the dead fiber in that array. And then you actually, this is represent actually the scanning area of that single fiber 
And each one of them is actually being scanned this way. And you can see that this is actually the lifetime may be different because of the fiber distortions. And so here is an example of actually how we do this scanning. We're scanning actually one fiber at a time. Uh, we, we, actually, we're scanning 100 fiber at the same time, but each of the fibers scan a smaller area in order to form these images. And uh, from there, we said, OK. And uh, this actually caused a lot of distortions, and especially using fiber. And this fiber costs us about $3,000 every time that we build a, a bundle. And if you have one fiber broke, and you have to replace the whole bundle. That become a hassle. And uh, we said, OK, how can we actually do this? And at the same time, the street camera is also very expensive. It's about $150,000 after sci-fi discount. And in this time, that they actually provide a real discount. And, uh, if you, and we, we actually incur, uh, in the very beginning, we have a disclaimer. How, how, how am I doing on time? I'm almost done. OK, um, yeah, I will probably finish in five. We're actually at tail. So we actually, in the beginning, we have a disclaimer that uh, one of the funding we got is for commercialization. They said, if you want to commercialize it, and uh, what does it take to actually sell it? We did a calculation. We said, optimistically, that if everybody buys our product, we're going to sell 50 per year. Sounds good. So we actually go back to ask the street camera manufacturer. And uh, we're going to actually give you 50 orders per year. And you must be very happy. And they said, yes, of course, that we only sell like five a year. And uh, 50 would be great. However, that uh, the price will triple for individual unit. We said, why? Typically, you buy in large quantity, you get a discount, right? And then now you actually come back, say, because you order more, each one of them becomes three times more expensive. They said because of street camera essentially made a large part of that uh, tool is made by hand. And uh, in order to actually ramp up to make 50, I have to hire three people more, and I have to train them. And uh, we have to build a new manufacturing capabilities. And uh, in order to do that, I have to raise my price. And so it's actually, commercially, that actually didn't work with street cameras. And uh, we said, OK, how do we going to actually do this? And uh, at least we want a few of them if we want to try that. So then I was working with um, another, in parallel, actually, originally, we were not actually trying to do this project. I was we collaborating with a colleague from uh, electro engineering, Dr. Jamal Dean, and making high-speed uh, camera chips. And uh, we're actually making the chips that uh, uh, called us uh, customized CMOS chips. So this is actually one of the examples we make. So the black dot is a photoactive area. Instead of like regular cameras, that we make those uh, chips that with a lot of electronics integrated between each of the pixels. That actually makes the pixel very far apart. And uh, they are not actually very efficient. Originally, we developed this and uh, for actual biosensing application. They're not actually meant for imaging. But since we actually start to use this uh, focal array type of acquisition, we found actually this fits well with actually this type of uh, uh, chips we are developing that uh, seems to have no use for imaging. And now we find a new use for it. So what happened is that because we can afford to put a lot of circuitry in each pixel, we can put a memory into each of the pixel, therefore that, and the processing power. So essentially, instead of actually moving those uh, uh, signals out from the chip to another place and then to processing and then move out, that's how your camera actually works. We actually have a readout on each one and the calculation on each one of the pixel. And uh, practically, it's not useful for imaging because when you actually talk about imaging, you lose a lot of light because you the calculation circuitry take a lot, a lot of real estate in those uh, chip designs. But in our case, that uh, since we're actually focusing, we want a sparse array to uh, acquire and then uh, avoid the uh, crosstalk. It actually fits well. 
And obviously, what we actually developed in the lab for this is uh, probably too uh, early. So there are actually commercial solutions for this type of uh, imaging devices, and uh, which we collaborate. And so we actually develop, we acquired uh, a couple of those chips, and we actually can get much better images and a much higher speed than the street camera. So here is the example. This is only the steady state confocal microscope uh, that we'll, com we'll compare this uh, uh, microscope. This is a steady state uh, slide uh, for a convalaria sample. And uh, if you're looking at it from the screen, you have tape and work for it. And it's much finer detail in the center and compare that to uh, a uh, traditional spinning disk confocal microscope. And we also, because we actually directly imaging into a large sparse array, we are able to actually create about four times the field of view than the spinning disk confocal. Well, that only a tenth of the acquisition time that, uh, to do that. And uh, this is uh, also enabled that uh, this is called a two-tap CMOS sensor. Essentially, for each of the pixel on the sensor pixel, that we can actually acquire two to three gate times and on its own, that you can adjust that. And uh, the limitation for this application of this type of sensor is that they only have 64 to 32 arrays at the moment. And, uh, but that actually more than enough for us. Remember that we are talking about 10 by 10 fiber arrays for $3,000. And uh, this can actually easily be expanded into that uh, uh, 10 times of that. So we're using, this is a 64 times 32 SPAD array. We're only using 32 by 32 of them because we're scanning a square area. So that's actually 10 times more focal spot that we can scan than a array, fiber array type of arrangement. And uh, so that gave, so by gating that we can even use an asymmetrical gating that uh, the gating time does not have to be the same. I'm going to not bore you for that. Okay, can you lower the, is it possible to lower the uh, light a little bit? So those are some of the images that, uh, uh, okay, that will be that light. And it's, uh, that's okay that uh, I think uh, you can, if you're interested, you can actually take a look at it on my computer afterwards. So essentially, this is a steady state image and this is a lifetime image with much finer detail. And the total scanning time that uh, is uh, around two seconds per film. And uh, so that's uh, uh, quite fast. And uh, that circle back to our original application that uh, uh, for high, high content screening, that our next step is actually build a high content microscope now. And uh, right now, this is all actually a very fast scan for one frame. And, uh, but because we can achieve two seconds per frame, now we actually are able to uh, plug in into a module that uh, into a regular uh, high content screening microscope. So here are some of the FRAT experiments we have done using this microscope. And uh, so the study, the, this, those are the two uh, channels for the two proteins that we label. And here is the combined lifetime image that to see that whether they have a flame or not. So typically those type of images are about, uh, this is a three to 30 by 30 scanning and then about a mag pixel, a thousand by a thousand pixel frame and uh, with about two seconds per flame time. That, uh, this is a confocal image. And uh, here's uh, another one. That, uh, again, that, uh, those are two steady state channels. And this is the one for PCLS XL. This is the one for BAT. We're using different uh, uh, colors to actually mark them. And here are the fluorescent lifetime changes that we're looking at. And so in summary that uh, we have uh, Basic, we're looking at the problem that for high content screening, and uh, uh, we start with a street camera based approach. Well, actually, we start with ICCD and go through a street camera, and then now we actually end up with a sparse uh, uh, SPAD array. And SPAD array means a single photon avalanche photodiod. And by the way, and uh, right now that uh, we have one of my grad students that uh, he decided to commercialize it. And uh, we're starting doing some of the commercialization, but, and our focus is actually, my, at least my focus is to uh, try to actually look at some of the application of this technology. Because now we have a new, uh, uh, new way to actually do confocal film. 
So one of the applications that we're looking at is uh, for tissue, for in vivo imaging and at very high speed, that uh, for, drug, for animal test and also that uh, organ or chip type of application that we can look that uh, those are confocal, so you can have a deeper penetration in 3D, and also the fact we can look at dynamic of the drug interaction that uh, using this. And uh, I also was work with uh, Dr. Andrews, and then looking at protein-protein uh, interactions for specific patients' uh, uh, cells interact with a specific drug. So originally, we're talking about thousands of or tens of thousands of drug leads, and we try to find out which one is the one that potentially can be a real drug that you can sell. But for chemotherapy, that uh, for a certain type of cancer, that typically you already have uh, three to five different chemo drugs that uh, has been proven effective for this type of cancer. But for a specific patient, typically one or two will actually be effective. But currently, how do you test which one? They don't know. They will just ask those patients to actually try one for three months. If it doesn't work, you try another one. But most of the patients, that they can't actually last more than two trials. If your first two trials are not so good, and uh, the patient won't be able to try the third one. So we are using this type of technology to see that whether we can that harvest uh, the patient's uh, tumor cells. We already know that they have tumor. And then using this type of cell-based uh, drug uh, screening technology to screen which one of the five that will actually work the best, and how actually they can work better, including that uh, different dosage uh, planning. And once you figure out a better uh, treatment plan, you can only apply that one to that specific patient. So that's a different way that we can do that. So that will be two, dire two directions that we're working on that. And uh, this is Dr. Andrews, our uh, main clinical collaborator, Anthony is a PhD student, Jean is the master student, built the system, and Nihad is the current PhD student, uh, he's finished up and in one, most of the battery based work. And our, uh, this project has been funded by CHR first, and uh, it's a rare occasion that in CHR funding instrumentation development, that's probably one of the first, and uh, also that uh, by CFI and Ontario Center of Excellence. That for the commercialization part. And thank you very much. I will bring the microphone and please hold the microphone, even though it's not going to be heard in the room. It's been recording. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for this great pr uh, presentation. You've gone through the, uh, the comparisons between the temporal resolutions for these different methods of combining the FLAM. I was wondering if you could quantitatively give us a scope of how spatial resolution changes between gating method or the spinning disk or the, uh, the uh, this photon uh, array, like how the spatial resolution between these methods differ. Okay, for the, thank you. That's actually a very good question. Spatial, we spend a lot of time it actually optimizes the spatial resolution. So uh, I will actually go back to one of the comparison slides. So the ISS uh, microscope and is uh, a spinning, one part of it is for the wide field. So this is a wide field microscope and, okay, that's a spelling error. So you can, typically the ICCD based approach will be closer to this wide field uh, imaging, but a little bit worse. Because ICC works as that uh, they put a, a device called a micro uh, multi photo multi channel plate that essentially you have uh, an input plate and then with uh, three to five micron holes in there and each one of them acting as a small photo multiplier tube and then your spatial resolution is determined by that and there are significant crosstalk at the end of it and. Uh, so this is actually the, this one is actually a wide field image. Typically the ICCD based spinning silicon focal will be approximately at other magnitude wise similar to that. And, uh, and here is actually a single 
photon, single spot uh, raster scan confocal that uh, show the ICCD in terms of uh, background subtraction and ICCD based confocal will be between, roughly between the two of this. And our system is uh, similar to the streak and the higher than the streak camera. So it's uh, similar to single photon confocal. And the reason is that the, uh, for the street camera based uh, technique, and uh, the, there are significant crosstalk between each of the fiber bundle. That's why we spend some time to uh, build the fiber delay to uh, s try to separate them out from the street camera image. And while well that uh, in the uh, spatter rate case, they're quite separated. Typically, that the separation is about 500, 300 to 500 microns. And our spot size is about uh, 20 microns that uh, uh, onto the spots, uh, the photoactive area. So typically, you don't actually see too much uh, crosstalk. And so the, I would say the spatial resolution will be similar to a single point confocal. Questions? Thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fascinating that you could increase up the speed of yeah. of the scanning, but I'm wondering that's uh, from from the glass part that you added to the microscope. Yeah. So if there should be a loss here, because if I mean, did the confocal scanning works kind of the same way? I mean, there's a laser scan that scans some spot. Yeah, that's right. And you added another scanning step next to it. So as I as as I got as I got it, uh, the laser of the confocal scans two micron. You just moves these two micron over 20 micron. So mm -hmm. if I add the third one to move it over 200 micron, someone adds the fourth one to just move it to 400 microns. I mean, adding these glass. OK, sorry for the confusion. Glasses. OK, I, I, I understand what you try to say. First is actually the there are lost. And then the lost is uh, slightly higher than a typical confocal but uh, f mostly because of the ab absorption of the glass. So in this, this is actually our scanning scheme. We do not have a mirror-based scanning. So we completely remove the scanning. Typical confocal, you're actually using a reflective mirror. You, let, let's just with one to scan back and forth. Therefore, at, uh, your uh, spot will actually go back and forth on the screen, right? Yeah. That's one dimension. You add another one with two. Typically, those mirrors have very high reflectivity, up to 99%. Well, that uh, we don't use that. We actually insert that the beam, the glass plates, into the beam as they actually transmit. And then we actually wiggling those beams and then scan the lateral position of the beam. So main loss in this aspect is actually the absorption and the surface reflection of that glass. And that is not insignificant. Very good you pick up that. So that loss is probably 10% more that, than the reflector. But we, we're not actually adding another level. Typically, what we found out is that this loss is almost negligible. And because we're actually our main loss in this type of setup is actually we also have a, a micro lens array to generate over here. So we have a micro lens array to generate those focus array. And then after you actually generate this, when you actually detection end, you also use the same array to focus each of the spot back to a very small spot. So those are actually uh, main losses. So uh, the scanning loss probably uh, negligible, but the other losses are not. So we are lost about 40% of light through this type of a process compared to a pure scanning scheme. But the uh, but, uh, added advantage for us is that uh, first, uh, this is uh, the spatter array is uh, significantly more sensitive than ICCD because the loss is low. And uh, so we are not at the efficiency level of single point confocal that you use a photomultiplier tube in the end, but uh, we are close to that. Uh, we are about 60% of that efficiency, which is uh, reasonably good. Okay, mm -hmm. just 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 a short one. Yeah. So it may sound stupid, but you you have developed you're losing some of the light at the beginning to make the array. Yeah. But the mirrors are so efficient. Why not using the mirrors with your method instead of the glass? I mean, there's a problem, and uh, because we're that's very clever, and uh, 
in, I probably don't have a board. I didn't have actually a schematic to show it. Mm -hmm. So if you can, let me see whether I can. OK. So you can see as we, if you use a, first we're talking about scanning array. And uh, the array is actually not small. The glass reflector, if you actually build a glass reflector, and you will find out that at the edges, when you scan, that is different from the center. They're not actually scanning at the same rate, especially when you're dealing with flame. And uh, as they actually, the path changes as you scan, they go with the angle. And that angle causes small differences in the path length of, uh, of uh, the light transfer. And then because we're talking about picosecond resolution, that difference is significant. And from the center to the edge, because this you can see as we scan the glass lights, the distances also change. But that change is uniformly from the center to the edge. And but the glass scanner, the mirror-based scanner is different from center to the edge because they're actually being scanned at different uh, distances at different angles. Um, I have a general question mm -hmm. in terms of applications. I really admire the effort and, and the te sometimes tedious, I'm sure, teasing out of the best um, three-dimensional, four-dimensional arrays you have to work mm -hmm. with to get a result. But so far, you've talked about using this to scan um, for screening of drugs. Mm -hmm. and. If they're tumors or cancerous tissues you're, you're trying to find the best drugs for, I'm wondering, could this thing be applied at the input side, scanning tumor tissue itself instead of having to grow it in the lab and examine it under a microscope, scan it in the lab for particular biochemical properties, and then that would point to an ensemble of drugs you're testing at the other end. Uh, yes, the answer is uh, yes, but uh, then uh, my understanding is that uh, you are trying to just uh, scan in the tumor cells on their own. Maybe uh, in live in the before surgery. <laughs> uh, that's actually one of the directions we want to do, but uh, it's not easy to, uh, uh, we always take the easier route, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. And, uh, we are actually trying to do this in vivo. At this time, we're trying to do it on a small animal model that uh, uh, it's easier to control the environment and then penetration depth is low. One of the problems with tumor is that uh, most of the uh, tumors are at, uh, once you've been developed, uh, it's hard to reach them. So one, and one of the ways we actually try to do this is actually through an endoscope that uh, a lot of uh, uh, GI cancers that at uh, uh, the inner surfaces of uh, the GI tract, that we actually can do this. And unfortunately, so far, we haven't been able to figure out a way to actually scan this that, uh, inside of the endoscope. And uh, so a little bit challenging where that's exactly where actually we want to go with that direction. But at this point, we're looking at uh, small animal models to see that whether we can do in vivo microscopy. And the one, actually, one thing that we have uh, just started trying is on uh, neural imaging. So that uh, you can actually do confocal neural imaging that on um, an uh, animal model or actually a cell model and uh, that uh, see uh, elegance type of uh, structure that uh, they're relatively transparent and uh, it's easy to handle. So that's uh, our first try in that. It's a very difficult question. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Any other questions? No? no? Okay. Right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.